Hi, everybody. We'll start in just about three minutes. We want to let everyone in the door. They're all in the waiting room. Hi everyone, welcome. We'll be starting in about three minutes. We just want to let everyone come on in. We have many people in the waiting room at the moment. Meanwhile, if you put in chat where you're from, I can say hello to everyone. I just always love to welcome you. I'm Gail Cormier and I'm from North Carolina. Where are you from? Ah, Karen from North Carolina too. And from Wisconsin. And we have Eileen from Taunton, Mass. And if you can't tell the accent, that's I'm from right around there. Oh, Muskegon? Is that how we say that? South Carolina, Montgomery, Alabama. Hi, Helen. We're from Memphis. We have a lot of people from Tennessee these days. Hi, Karen from Washington. Oh, it's going so fast. Hi, Amy from Albany. And Melody from Washington State. Welcome. Oh, Trudy from Hawaii. You're going to be very interested, hopefully, in this presentation. Do you know Amanda? She's your boss. Aloha. Hi, Ruth. And Michelle. Hi, Michelle from Idaho. Hello, Keela from Wisconsin. We'll begin in just a couple of minutes while we're letting everybody in the door. Hi, Mary from Lenore, North Carolina. We are going to have a great presentation today, and we'll begin in just one more minute. Julie from Oregon, whereabouts in rural Oregon? I don't know how to pronounce that. That CIO? I don't know where that is in Oregon. Yeah, it's CIO. I actually moved from the metro, the Portland metro area earlier this year. So I'm I went from Portland Metro to a little tiny town with a thousand people. So wow. Change. And now do you work do you work for the family org? I work for OHSU. Um and then I work um with all of our county mental health programs and uh, OFSN and all our colleagues supporting the family workforce in crisis care. Oh, that's fabulous. Really happy to be here. Hi, Corey. Hi, Angela. Okay, I think we can begin as people trickle in. So, good afternoon, and on behalf of our principal investigator, Dr. Linda Goggin, and myself, welcome to the National Family Support Technical Assistance Center's office hours. This is a running series. Today's topic is organizational well-being. I'm Gail Cormier, the project director of NASTAC, the Family Center of Excellence. We are led by the National Federation of Families. The monthly office hour series are designed with the family workforce in mind. This series is targeted for family-run executive directors and emerging 
and current family leaders. NASTAC wishes to support all of the family work support workforce. In order to accomplish this, we will be hosting additional sets of series for other family support workforce staff as we continue along. Before we start our interactive conversation today, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's conversation is being recorded. The recording and any other additional resources will be uploaded to our NASTAC website under the events tab. It'll take about two weeks tops, but it will be up there. If you have any technical difficulties, please type your comment and someone will be able to assist you. Please also type your questions for the presenter in the chat box. We'll be watching the chat during the entire presentation. And really, I can't stress this often enough. We want this to be interactive. So take notes as our presenters are talking, get ready with your questions. This is your time to ask questions and come away from this meeting with some tools. Our goal, of course, is to encourage a conversation between our guest presenters and all those in attendance. We ask that you take time to complete a short feedback survey using the link provided at the end of this presentation. The survey will help us continuously improve our events, and it also fulfills our SAMHSA funding obligations to provide them with important data required by our contract. Please note, all information will be confidential and we will respect your privacy. We do not offer CEU credits for our events, but you will receive a certificate of attendance after the survey is completed. What will happen is when you leave here today, you will be directed to the survey, you will fill out the survey, and then you'll be redirected again to your, your certificate. I would like to thank SAMHSA for allowing us to share this information with you today, and thank you for joining us. At this time, I would like to introduce NASTAC's project manager for this series, Dana Aspey. Dana? Thank you so much, Gail. Um, thanks so much for being here with us. As Gail mentioned, we are going to make this an interactive discussion. Once we get to our discussion portion, we do want to remind you that we use family-centered language. So make sure when you're sharing in the chat or when you take yourself off mute during the discussion that the language you use is trauma-responsive, strengths-based, non-judgmental, and respectful. We're so excited that you're here, whether this is your first office hour in this series or your third. We want to remind you of our goals. This series is meant to support executive directors and emerging leaders in family-run organizations through peer support. We're also hoping to help increase your knowledge of leadership, management, and mentorship skills by bringing in experts like Sean Perry and Amanda Hawkins. And finally, we want to provide you with a roadmap towards organizational well-being to enhance your staff satisfaction, your family engagement, and your organizational sustainability. We do have a format that we try to follow each month. First, you get a little presentation from subject matter experts to learn about those new skills and strategies and tools. Then we want to make sure that we give you some tips for mentorship, and that mentorship is going to happen between our office hour series. And we'll talk later about what you can do if you don't already have a mentor. Then we want to make sure at the very end of each hour together each month, we have a short peer discussion about your own experiences, including what's working and the challenges that you have. We'll leave you each month with a workbook that includes an action plan to implement some of the small steps that you're getting each month so that by the time the series is over, you'll be able to look back and see that you've enhanced your organizational well-being. So we're going to start today with a Mentimeter poll. So if you haven't done this before, you're going to visit the website menti, www.menti.com. It's going to ask you to type in a code, and that's up there on the screen. Gina has also put that in the chat for you. So you'll type in that code, and then you'll see two questions pop up. The first one, how do you feel after a great training or professional development session? This is going to create a word cloud for us, so please just use one word to describe how you feel, and you can choose up to three words that really give us a sense of how you feel after a really good training or professional development session. After you answer that question, a second question will pop up. 
and it's going to ask you if your organization offers coaching to family peers. If you work in an organization other than a family-run organization, you can just apply that to your staff. So again, that information is in the chat. Oh, code cannot be found. Sorry about that. I must need to click present. There we go. Let's see if that, oh, it refreshed the code. Sorry about that, folks. 36391257 is our new code. <laughs> I'll put that in the chat for you. So we're still going to menti.com. We've got a new code. 36391257. We're already seeing some words popping up invigorated, inspired, excited, panicked, curious, refreshed, encouraged, motivated. The more responses, the bigger that word gets. So lots of excitement, lots of motivation and empowerment. Energized, expanded, revitalized, prepared, overwhelmed, curious, enlightened, brave, fulfilled. Great. Let's check on our other question and I'll make sure to send out the completed word cloud for everyone as well. So if you haven't already answered that second question, does your organization offer coaching to family peers? Go ahead and choose one of those options. And if you have any comments on this question, feel free to share those in the chat and we'll open it up to our discussion as well. Looking like uh, so far, majority of the responses are yes. Oh, now it's switched to no. <laughs> but we've got an almost equal yes and no. regular coaching sessions throughout the career. Few, few less people are getting them when they're new to the field and some folks who don't have any. All right, well, I'll share the results of that in our follow-up email as well. Thank you so much for participating. And now I would love to introduce you to our first speaker, Amanda Hawkins. She's the program director for Ohana Support Services Program at Child and Family Services in Hawaii. She has an educational background, including a master's of social work from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. With a background in program evaluation and quality assurance, she works with her team to identify and develop training opportunities to provide family peer specialists with the tools needed to best support the families they work with. I'll pass it over to Amanda to talk to us today about her training. Hello, everyone. So um, like Dana mentioned, I'm from Hawaii. So while I'm starting my day, I know many of you are at the end of yours. So good morning and good afternoon. Um, so my name is Amanda Hawkins, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about how we train um, and orient our family pair workforce when they begin with us. Um, so next on our next slide, I have a little bit of a blurb about what our program is. So we have parent partners who provide support to parents and caregivers of youth who are experiencing behavioral, emotional, and or mental health challenges. So our parent partners work with the families to empower them um, to advocate for their youth, to provide assistance in parenting education, um, to help with that advocacy and help them find their voice. Uh, encouraging self-care for the caregivers, and then identifying and helping them access community resources. So um, as part of our onboarding, our parent partners strive to become fa certified family peer specialists within one year of hire through the National Federation of Families. So we track our direct service supervision and training. So what I'm going to be speaking on today is our training piece. Um, so on our next slide, um, China Family Services, we have an organization training pipe. So this is organization-wide. Every program within our organization follows an organization training plan. And it serves as a guide for all staff to follow their training requirements. 
Um, these plans reflect the Council on Accreditation and Contract Requirements and are monitor monitored by our Performance and Training Department. So there are three tiers to our training plans. We have organizational training, so that's organization-wide everybody has to do. Program specific, so looking at things specific to the program that we're working in, and then continuing education, so those annual requirements. So on our next slide, I talk about our new higher orientation. So this is something we do organization-wide as well. So this is for all new hires coming into Child and Family Service. This takes place twice a month on the 1st and 16th of the month at the beginning of our pay periods. Um, and it's a comprehensive training on various aspects of our organization. So we make sure all departments have a voice here. So we have HR, IT, fiscal, performance and training and facilities all have a little segment in this new higher orientation. And this serves to give everybody a little introduction to the different departments and gives a face to the different departments. So if anyone has questions or needs support, they know who to go to. This also sets the stage for the culture of our organization. Um, and I'll show you a little bit about that on our, um, my next slide. Um, so, uh, sorry, Dana, next slide. Um, this is our agenda for our new hire orientation. So it's a two-day training that all staff go through. And you can see that um, we have all the different departments represented here. Um, we have different topics. We talk about um, access to the buildings, access to email, things like that on our first day, um, talking about our family center philosophy and an organization overview. So setting that stage of what it is that our organization does, who we serve, and what our culture is. On the next slide, I, um, I'm sharing with you guys our orientation checklist. So you can see how comprehensive it is. It's five pages long. Um, it goes over everything that anybody would need when coming into our organization. So looking at facilities, um, daily operations, technology and software, safety, making sure everyone knows what the policies and procedures are for all of these different departments and areas, and then how to go about doing their jobs. Um, next, I have our program specific training. So this is developed by the program to cover all aspects of service delivery. Um, so internally, we um, identified things like program specific policies and procedures, roles and responsibilities of team members and of the participants we're serving, um, intake process and documentation. Um, our, we outline in the first month of hire all the different topics we'd like our new staff to hit when they are training so that they are aware of what their role is in this position. Um, the training is primarily self-guided with follow-up and re review in our weekly supervisions. And then we also offer opportunities per, for professional shadowing and mentoring of the peers. And then all staff are provided with the physical binder of the materials and access to our electronic version so that what the, whether they prefer paper or a computer, they have the tools that they're, they need. Um, so these are the tools on this slide. So that's our, um, our binder. It has this cover sheet right here. Um, our table of contents outlines where everything can be found. So it's a quick access book that they can use at the start of their job when they're training and throughout their time with us in this program. So if they need, if they have a question on service delivery, they can look in this binder first and then discuss in supervision. And then this is that outline week by week of what we'd like them to hit when they are doing these self-guided trainings. Um, on this next slide, I talk about internal training. So we use a Reliance database system. So it's an online training database. It has thousands of recorded trainings on various topics. Um, many of the trainings are assigned at the start of hire and annually. Um, so we have recorded trainings that were developed by a performance and training team on things like mandated reporting and um, COVID even um, that are required for all staff to take. Um, we also have additional trainings that can be assigned as identified in supervision. So if we're talking in supervision and a family is having issue with their youth's diagnosis of ADHD. Um, they, we can find a training on that through our Relias training database and assign that so that, that um, the parent partner can learn more about how to support that family. Uh, we also do a lot of external training. So we work with our partners, our funders, um, the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Division. So we work with them a lot um, to find trainings and participate in trainings they host. Um, the National Federation of Families, uh, we work with them quite a bit and we attend the conference every year. Um, and then we strive to attend IVAD as well, um, at least the Hawaii one. Uh, we haven't done San Diego yet, but someday we hope to. 
And then these are two Hawaii-based um, training opportunities. So the Evidence-Based Services Committee and then Hawaii Public Health Training, who we offer a lot of training opportunities. Um, we track our training documentation. So staff complete training documentation forms for all trainings that they do that are not on Relias. The ones that are on Relias are automatically tracked. So anything external, they have to complete a form and provide some kind of proof that they attended and um, completed the training. Last year, we logged a total of 377 training hours. And then we also have an internal program Excel document to track our progress towards the certification process. So um, we wanna make sure that as we reach the total hours needed for certification application, we are aware of that. And then finally, we have our professional development and peer support um, on the next slide. Thanks, Dana. So um, I offer reflective weekly individual supervision with all staff where we do clinical and administrative discussions. So we talk about the families that we're working with and what they're experiencing and what barriers we're having with them um, so that we can identify training opportunities. Uh, we monitor training progress and barriers to service delivery. So um, talking story and learning about what's going on, what, need, what we may need to find additional trainings and to help um, address barriers. We also do weekly group supervision. So this is an opportunity for our parent partners to do peer support. So we talk about what's going on again with the families as a uh, larger group, and then parent partners are able to provide peer support to each other and give feedback and exa um, examples and ideas that they have experienced in the past. Uh, we also do trainings together as a larger group so we can bring in speakers from outside in the community. Um, we also put together our own trainings based on what's identified in that individual supervision and our weekly group supervision. Uh, I also like um, try to send out a monthly survey to staff regularly regarding barriers and training interests. So if anybody has an interest, they can share that and have a voice. Um, more recently, we've identified motivational interviewing. So we've been trying to do more trainings in motivational interviewing. And then parent partners are encouraged to share training opportunities with team members. So if someone attended a training that they found especially helpful, um, or they know of one that's coming up that's gonna be a live training, we encourage them to bring that to the team and share. And then on the next slide, I have my contact information. So if anyone has any questions or would like to chat with me more, um, I have my phone numbers and my email down here. And then this is our program line if anyone has any questions about our program. Thank you so much, Amanda. That was a wealth of information condensed into 10 minutes. And again, in case you missed it, these slides will be sent out via email a few days after today's event. And we will have a list of some options for trainings that you might be able to use in your organization. So go ahead and get some questions ready for Amanda and you can start putting those in the chat for our discussion. Now I am pleased to introduce the founder and president of We Are Hope, Sean Perry. Sean has two decades of coaching experience and working with youth. He ran some residential treatment centers for mental health and observed that mental health care was supporting the haves rather than the have nots. So he founded We Are Hope. He's a certified life coach, behavioral, cognitive behavioral coach, nonviolent violent crisis intervention specialist and instructor who is certified in childhood trauma, exposure response prevention specialist, signs of suicide prevention trainer, collaborative problem solving, international trainer in emotional CPR, and a curriculum writer and trainer for youth emotional CPR. Um, so we are very pleased to welcome Sean to talk to us about the importance of coaching our staff. Sean, take it away. Well, hello everyone, and, and thank you all for having me. And I just wanna say, Amanda, kudos, great job uh, leading us in, and, 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 and thank you so much for all the work that you're doing over there in Hawaii. Um, so again, I, I'm here today to talk to you guys about how we coach our staff. And I think that that starts with leadership, right? We have to understand who we are. So I'm going to ask a couple of questions. You can see them here, uh, posted or on the slides, but one of the questions that each and every person, each and every individual here, who's in, le in a leadership role, you have to ask yourself who exactly are you, right? What, is your, what are your core beliefs and your foundational work that you do for yourself? And the reason that that's important is because your, lead, your leadership and the way in which you lead, the way in which you coach those around you directly comes from what, you, what your core beliefs are, right? 
And so when we think of that, we also have to ask ourselves, what is our mission and what is our vision within the company? And why that's important is because the mission and vision that are in the company, and I want you all to hear me here, are not just written for those you serve. Let me say that one more time. Your mission and vision for your companies are not just written for those you serve. They're, those for, they're for those who are in your organization as a whole. And if you're not supporting your mission and vision by supporting your people through said mission and vision, then you're off the mark, right? Leadership is not about directives and making sure everyone is doing what they're supposed to be doing. It's about lifting those up around us to be the best versions of themselves constantly, okay? So again, everybody, your mission and vision is for everyone in the workplace, not just those you serve, right? So how do these apply to your team, right? We just talked about that a little bit. So your team is an extension of your mission and your vision, right? Your team is a, is a large part, if not the main part of, of what it is that, that you plan to accomplish. And, and I just wanna kind of give an example. So when I was in residential working for others many years ago, um, one of the things that I noticed was that the people that were, that were in the role of what we would consider support staff those were the ones doing the body of work. Those were the people that were fulfilling the mission and vision. And whenever it wasn't being fulfilled, it was because leadership wasn't living to that. And so it's so important that we understand that it does apply to our team, okay? Now, when we talk about coaching for success, we also have to understand that if your team is unhealthy physically, emotionally, mentally, your company is unhealthy, okay? So when, when we take that into context, as a leader, it is our responsibility to make sure that every member of our team has the tools necessary to be emotionally and mentally healthy. Now, some may say, well, Sean, listen, you know, I, you know, my job is to check boxes. My job is to make sure that they're productive. My job is to make sure that they're following the rules and expectations of our organization. And I can tell you that although that is part of it, that is far from the mark of leadership, right? Our job as leaders is to walk our people through the things that are needed um, daily for them to be successful. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that as we keep going. And so one of the things that we do to make sure that that's possible is we, uh, we train in compassion and empathy. We train, let me say that again. And I, I, I don't like repeating myself, but I think that this is so poor. I, I, I like to repeat myself when I believe that it just needs to be said again. We train in compassion and empathy because we believe that it is absolutely the key to success, right? All of our coaches are trained in emotional CPR, all of them. All of the people that work for us at some point have had uh, an emotional CPR experience and understanding how to support themselves and others in emotional crisis, how to connect on a heart-to-heart -heart level, how to work through and build through empathy and compassion and love. And so, when I meet with my team, any member of my team, one of the first things I say are, is, how are you doing, right? I want to know how they're feeling, what's going on with them, with inside their lives. I want to be part of that because when I'm part of that, then they're part of this larger thing called We Are Hope. They're part of that larger thing called your specific organizations. So when we train with the foundation of compassion and empathy, we naturally build success within our organizations. So we also teach skills, not only for your team to support others, but to support themselves. And I just talked about that in emotional CPR. You know, within our organization, all of our coaches, and, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, 
are trained in emotional CPR to some degree. Some have the full, some have the full, the full training. Some have only taken a two hour intro, which is still a really strong foundation in it. But, but it's important that they have that. But also all of our coaches are life coaches. And why that's important is because when they're struggling, they have the tools necessary to work through that struggle. If they're struggling and can't get through it, they have another coach that can support them. They have myself who can support them. We'll talk a little bit about that also. And so giving the skills and teaching the skills, not only for your team to support others, but themselves is, is, is paramount to the success of an organization, I specifically believe. I, 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 I don't believe in, in the years of doing this, I don't believe that it is our only role and responsibility to support those that we serve, but to be the supporter of those who are supporting others. And when we do that, we create an extremely healthy environment within the workplace. So why daily and weekly check-ins are important. Now, for, for me here at We Are Hope, we believe in having our, our thumb on the pulse of everything that we do. And why that's important is because we hire independent contractors. Everyone who is part of, who works for us is an independent contractor. So within, within that independent contractor framework, we have to make sure that um, all of our team members are doing well. So we, we check in with our team every single day at some point throughout the day um, to, build that, to build that capacity to let them know that someone's there. Team meetings with focus on what's right rather than what's wrong. We have to stop focusing on, focusing on what's wrong and start focusing on what's right so that we can shift the mindset of our staff. Next slide. The trainings we use are designed to make people, to make our people better not more productive. And what do I mean by that? I mean, simply, if our people are naturally better, they feel love, they feel empathy, they feel compassion, they feel like this job means something to them, they're naturally going to be more productive. Just think about it. If you go to work every day loving what you do, you're naturally going to do more of it. And we give a roadmap for success and drive them to the destination if necessary. We give a roadmap, we lay it out for our team. And if they are struggling, we ho literally hold their hand and walk, walk them through every aspect of how to be the best version of themselves constantly. And so the, the three main trainings that we give within our, within our team are life coaching. I believe that it is vital for every human being on this planet to understand how to be a life coach, how to support others, um, anxiety, education, cognitive behavioral education, emotional CPR, and Pathways to Empower, which is a neuroscience-based mental health educational platform. We believe that education, educating our staff and supporting our staff through said education is absolutely the key to success. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sean. This was great. Thank you, Amanda. If we can put on a on cameras and let everybody see everybody. This would be a great time to have a, a bit of a discussion. So Dana, if you can let everybody show our faces, please feel free to take yourselves off mute and sh let's see see everybody's beautiful face here. Um, I have a couple questions to get us started. First question is for either Sean or Amanda. How can leaders avoid just checking those required boxes with supervision to instead provide the type of coaching support that connects directly with staff to understand their needs and supports? How do you give that individualized supervision? Amanda, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I mean, Sean kind of shared about it in one of his slides, but having weekly check-ins is a really big thing for us here. So I do individual and group weekly with everybody to make sure that we are, we have our thumb on that pulse. We know what's going on in their lives, um, in their families' lives. And um, we have a good understanding of where they are physically and mentally. So if someone is struggling, I can touch on that with them and discuss it in supervision and see if there's any support they need, whether that's um, to take some time off for self-care or if it's a training need. 
Um, I feel like that's a really important piece of it. And then another piece I think is getting to know your staff. So learning about their professional experience, learning about their lived experience um, within their boundaries, of course, Let, letting them set that boundary, but still getting to know what their background is so that we know how to best support them. And Sean, do you have anything to follow up? Yeah, so 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 uh, I just want to kind of piggyback off of Amanda and say it's about the human experience, right? My my those who work for me, we honestly say here we are hope they work with us, right? They don't work for me, they don't work for us, and so it's about treating them as human beings and making sure that they have any and everything that they need in regards to support, to have those constant communications and those constant conversations about who they are, what their needs are, and more importantly, how we as an organization can help them and work and walk them through whatever needs that they have. One, one question before we open it up to everybody. What is the one tool or technique that you can give participants today to help them with supervising and coaching? What's that one tool they can take away today? I think for me, it's just keeping an open format and being really good about listening when you are doing supervision. So not really going into it when you're doing weekly check-ins with an agenda, just starting it off with that. How are you doing? How, how's your life going? How are your, um, how are your families that you're working with doing and opening it up for discussion there and letting them guide the discussion. Oh, I love that. Sean. Yeah, I, I agree. And I also think, and I said it before, treating them as humans, right? That's, 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 that's the key, but also not focusing on what needs to be fixed or changed, right? But really identifying and focusing on what they're doing well, right? In our society, we are, we, it's so easy for us. Our brains are designed to look at what's wrong in a situation. And we really have to train our brains to really focus on all that's going right. And if we start at every meeting with what's going well, you change the dynamic and how your organization looks at everything. Oh, I like that too. Excellent, excellent tips. Okay, for the audience, please, if you would like to type and ask me to ask the facilitators, or if you'd like to ask questions into the chat, or feel free to raise your hand and ask questions directly. Do we have any questions? Um, I have a question for Amanda. Go ahead, Dan. Um, I really loved seeing sort of how comprehensive your training schedule was. Um, and so in reference to that, uh, we're kind of a smaller org. So our coaches, uh, whether they be family or peer coaches, they're they're paid via stipend for the sessions they have, right? So we don't really have the background or the resources to have a two day long introductory training, but I really would love that. And so like, that's kind of being like, okay, what are my avenues for paying them for that time? But then what would you suggest could be like good alternatives if you are working with coaches on a stipendiary position versus being staff uh, on how to get them comprehensive? training. So I know we do have a very long two day training and we've gotten that feedback too, that sometimes it's a little overwhelming. So I know our performance team have talked about like kind of condensing it and trying to shorten the presentation so that we can try to condense it, condense it into one day training. Um, so I don't know if that's something that could be more feasible for you guys is like a one day training, but trying to work everything in. Um, I'm not too familiar with um, stipend paid versus staff, so I, I don't know about financial revenue and all of that types of things in terms of training, um, but I could definitely sidebar with you if I and have some time to look <laughs> look up all that information. Yeah, um, and I, I'm excited to look at the, the Relias learning stuff that you also shared too, because I think that would be super helpful to have them maybe self-direct some of their training outside of yeah. here. Yeah, and all of our staff that come in are very eager to learn and they're excited to look through it and see what they're interested in and find those things um, on their own time even, which is great. <laughs> There's another question that says, how are coaches supported with the weekly check-ins? Amy, feel free to jump in if you'd like. This comes from Amy Paroli from New York. Hi, yes. So. Um, and thank you for getting my last name correct. Nobody ever gets that correct. So kudos to you. 
Um, uh, yeah, so, you know, we're focusing a lot on how we're supporting, you know, those that are being coached. How are your coaches being supported, right? So, so what's the infrastructure that you have in place to support your coaches so that you're, um, you know, you're being preventative about, you know, uh, consideration for burnout, um, you know, and self-care for your coaches? So on my end, um, we frequently talk about self-care. So that's one of our check-in questions is what are what have you done for self-care this week or what do you plan to do for self-care? Um, in our groups, I also try at least once a month to incorporate some kind of self-care activity for us to do as a team so that we are at least practicing self-care together once a month. In, in what we do here at We Are Hope, um it's consistent, we consider, we call it consistency and support. So it's the level of frequency that, that we're reaching out to our staff. So like I said, we reach out to our staff every single day, whether it's email, whether it's phone, whether it's video chat, whether it's FaceTime, no matter what it is, we are, we are constantly reaching out. And as far as what they need for support, we leave that up to them, right? One of the things we also do is we don't work an eight hour day. Our, our coaches work six hours a day. That's all they work, Monday through Friday. They do not get a phone call after their time they're done. They do not hear from us on the weekends. We give them all the time in the world to, to be who they need to be for, them, for their family. So our coaches work 30 hours a week. That's it. And we pay them full-time pay. Thank you, Sean. We have a couple of questions coming in that were sent to me. It says, despite one hour supervision weekly and almost daily check-ins, how to address staff that claims 40 hours on their time card, yet the work that they're reporting, the data that we're reporting does not reflect that amount of work. How does a supervisor handle that? Well, I think it's just an open conversation, right? I mean, at... at I've I've never been shy to tiptoe around any 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 situation. Um, I think it's a, it's a sit down and a conversation. You know, show the data, and and let's have a conversation around it and talk about why it, why it's why it doesn't look right. Um, but I think I think doing it from a from a place of genuine um, intrigue, right? Really wanting to know if it be, if it comes off accusatory, then you know they're gonna they're gonna step back and and put up the walls. So genuinely ask. It sounds like you you have some genuine questions. Find out what the answers are. Amanda, do you have any follow-up? Yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, if I would ever notice something off, I would come to the staff member and mention, like, I noticed this on your calendar. There are some gaps here. Can we brainstorm, um, talk about what happened and maybe brainstorm some ways to fill your calendar to make sure you're fulfilling your duties and you have your 40 hours a week and whatnot. Thank you. And I have a question for Sean. Knowing that organizations can be at different levels of structure and sustainability, what is something that any organization can do to begin changing and strengthening internal culture? I like that question a lot. Um, I, think, I think first and foremost, um, looking at the leadership and seeing if the leadership is willing to change that internal culture, first and foremost, right? Because if the leaders aren't on board, it's not going to work. Uh, secondly, have a strength-based, human-based approach, right? That is, that is the, I, I honestly believe that's the key. So what I would do um, and what we have done is I pull my entire team together. I give them a day of training, a day of, of wellness, um, food, <laughs> right? You name it and say, Hey guys, this is the direction that we're going. in." And, you know, rather quickly, you'll find specific, especially from the leadership, if the leadership believes in this and if they want to be part of this. Um, but that would be the way that I would go is to just pull everybody in and say, we're making a change. This is the time where we're going to grow and heal together and make it about that journey. And then also if you're in a position to, depending on the size of your organization, offer therapy and wellness to your to your team. 
I guess another follow-up question to that was, would you recommend bringing in a therapist slash counselor? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I recommend bringing in coaches, therapists, whatever you feel is, is um, applicable to your, to your organization. Um, sometimes, you know, a therapy session might be a little bit too deep in the middle of work, right? But at least having access to one could be very beneficial, but having a coach in the building could be extremely helpful to come in, do those check-ins and, and work through something that might be going, might be going on and difficult. Or if you're not bringing someone in, specifically having someone in your building that's trained, right, to be able to, to fill that void, to fill that gap. Absolutely. Thank you. And Amanda, the questions are coming in. I can't keep up here. Amanda, what type of self-care activities do you do with your team? Oh, we've done um, a lot of things. So a lot of the things that I've done recently have been more um, cognitive behavior, um, motivational interviewing based things that they could use with the families they're working with, but we do it as a team so that we can reflect on our own lives. Um, so it serves as a training and self-care. Um, one of the more fun activities we did last year, um, we sent out painting supplies and back before COVID, paint and sip was all the craze, right? Um, we didn't sip, but we painted as a group in our group supervision that day. And we posted a picture on the Zoom and everybody painted from where they were. So that was one of our fun activities. And we have all of their paintings posted in our main office area. Um, so just thinking outside of the box and trying to come up with something fun, also thinking about the interests of the people that you're working with. So if there's something that um, one of your staff members is really interested in, um, trying to incorporate that into your self-care activity and maybe asking them to facilitate and lead if they're interested and comfortable. Thank you. And one person said, every Friday we have Zoom painting day where they do just what you said, that the whole staff fills in as they go about their business on a Friday, help paint a picture. Um, my, another question is, my organization is working on changing at the foundational level. Amanda, are there any policy and procedures that are strength-based trauma, strength trauma-informed focus? I'm hesitant to in, reinvent the wheel. You're on mute. Sorry, I'm just reading the question, trying to understand it. <laughs> um, well, so I think just recognizing your organization's culture, what you're aiming for, um, and then focusing on the language you want to use and working with your team to develop what um, what your policies and procedures will look like. And don't there's really no need to reinvent the wheel. Try to find work on, tweak what you have existing. So um, taking the existing policies and procedures and just changing the language and tweaking them a little bit to meet the new goals. Mm -hmm. And just so I can add, um, NASTAC does have personalized technical assistance. So if you need a TA request, we can get together and decide what you need to help you with, with just this type of um, question that you have. Um, I have one, another, med mental health first aid. Do you use mental health first aid techniques with your staff? Who's the, who's the question for? It's for either one of you. It just says uh, that. We, we, we absolutely do not. Okay. We, we use, Emotional CPR, um, we find it much more um, human-based connect connectedness um, than mental health first aid. Thank you, Sean. Amanda? Um, we do not use that a formal mental health first aid. I'm sure we have some components of it in what we do, but <laughs> we are, um, are not trained in or use that at this time. But I am interested in talking to Sean on the side about that emotional CPR. Yes. All right. Do we have any other questions? Feel free to raise your hand and ask. We have about two more minutes. Anyone with a question? Oh, I have another question that came in. What? How do you supervise employees versus contractors? Is there a difference? 
Um, no, not not the way that we see it. Uh, we we see that everyone is equal in the sense of um, they're human beings, and we want to make sure that everybody has the best support possible. So our contractors are um, all of our coaches, and the only two employees of my organization are myself and the other uh, co-founder. So he supports me, and I support him <laughs> when we need some help. So <laughs> we support each other the same. Okay, thank you. And Karen asked that she has heard that people say mental health first aid is out of date. That's not an outdated tool. What are your thoughts? So I, I think that the mental health first aid in particular is is a is a great resource for a layman who would like to know a lot about mental health disorders and would like to know who to contact if someone is struggling with one. Um, like I said, I, I've taken it. I've, we, we just no longer use it. I, I will not speak ill of another, um, of another, of another training, but I will say that we don't believe that it is the best resource available to us as people. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, this is actually just in time. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, Sean, Amanda, this was fabulous. I appreciate you coming in and helping us with um, this information. I hope everybody has some tools that they're gonna be able to use when they go back. Um, I wanna thank Amanda and Sean for today and thank everyone for your participation. A special thanks to the NASTAC staff for helping us run today's event smoothly. Now I have a request for you. I mentioned at the top of this event, please take some time to fill out our survey. When you exit this event, you'll be redirected to the survey, survey site. Thank you again. And here's the um, Office Hour Work board, Book. Feel free to click on it, but it will also be sent to you in our follow-up email. So we will, we do want to leave you with some action steps when you get that workbook. We're going to ask that you take some time to evaluate your organization's training opportunities and determine where there might be room for growth. And in that workbook, there'll be some time for you to jot down your thoughts on that. We'll also ask that you reflect on how your organization can utilize coaching to better support staff and to meet with your mentor and men or mentee. Lachelle did put the link to our NAFSTAC TA request form in there. If you don't already have a mentor, we invite you to fill that out and we can match you with someone who might be able to help support your organizational growth and sustainability. And we want to also invite you to next month's office hour. We're going to be hearing from Ann Smith, the executive director of AFCAMP Advocacy for Children about social justice for family-run organizations. That's on Tuesday, February the 14th at 3 p.m. Please contact us if you have any questions. And if you want to pull out your phone to scan that QR code to get to the survey that Gail just mentioned, or just close this link and it'll pop up for you. We really appreciate your feedback. Yeah, the, uh, the link on the PowerPoints are not active. Oh, no. Thank you, Melody. You're welcome. When you exit out of this meeting, you'll be taken to the survey. And if you're not, please feel free to email one of us and we'll get you the survey. We will, thank we, you. yes, go ahead. Sorry, I was just gonna say thank you to you and Sean and Amanda and everybody else. This has been wonderful. Oh, we appreciate it, Melody. Um, the QR code does work is what Lachelle's saying. We're going to stay on just for about five minutes because I know when we leave, we sometimes take the survey with us. So if you can, as you leave out, if you could do that quickly, that would be great. And Sean and Amanda, thank you very much. If you don't have to wait with us. You feel free to come back in the 15 minutes so we can debrief. Thank you.
Thank you, Willamette. Just remember, as you exit out, you'll be taken to the survey. And if you could do that as soon as possible, that would be great. I will be closing this presentation at four o'clock. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Yeah. We'll see you next time. Absolutely. Bye. Bye. Thank you everyone for coming. As you leave the Zoom today, you'll be taken to the survey. I'd appreciate it if you fill out the survey. We will be closing Zoom in three minutes. Thanks, Adrian. Dana, are you the lead or am I here? I am the host. If you want to take off, I can close this out in just a minute. Oh, you can make me the host and I'll close it out. It doesn't matter. Okay. Doesn't Good, matter. Jo <laughs> Good job, Dana. Good job. <laughs> Thank you. I have the slide up, so I'll just I'll stick around. <laughs> All right. I'll see you in a few minutes. Okay, sounds good.